before we start, I will, I need to give a huge shout out to the Greater Manchester Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament um, because it is thanks to that awesome group that we are able to host and put this on today and actually like keep this series going over the next two weeks. Um, so that's, yeah, massive shout out. Thank you, thank you so much. So yeah, Doug, go for it. Okay, uh, hi, I'm Doug, um, Research Post Director at the Conflict Environment Observatory. Uh, who are we, you ask? Uh, we're a charity based up uh, in Mythamroy, just next to Hebden Bridge. And our thing is working to increase the protection of people and ecosystems from the impact of armed conflicts and military activities. And one of the big issues for us was that the environment has been kind of invisible in conflict. So we're focusing on monitoring environmental damage in conflict. And that's stuff that happens, incidents, but also long-term environmental trends. Um, working on tools to help increase data collection. So that's fancy stuff with satellites, but also looking at how communities can uh, gather data themselves. And we also work on a lot of legal and political processes that are ongoing at the moment, which I'll talk about in a wee bit. Um, uh, so yeah, and we can contribute the data that we collect to these international processes and things. So I'm going to talk a bit about how the environment is damaged in conflict, have a particular sort of look at conflict pollution and toxic remnants of war, and then look at some of these processes uh, and things. So first thing you need to think about um, around environment and conflict, the pointer out. So it's not just during conflict that the environment is damaged, there are environmental issues which can contribute to conflicts. And then the environment is quite important post-conflict to help build peace um, and sustain peace. So in the last sort of five, ten years, it's been kind of this emerging field of environmental peace building, um, which tries to look at different policies throughout this continuum before, during and after conflicts and looking at how the environment can uh, sustain conflicts, how it can be affected by conflicts and how it can help build peace. So pre-conflict you can look at how the environment and natural resources in particular can start causing tensions and grievances so for example if you had climate change impacts impacting uh, natural resources that communities depend on that might cause grievances and tension in those communities you could look at high value resources like oil or diamonds and look at how they can start to finance and fuel conflicts then you can look at how the environment is becomes a weapon of war in some sometimes and how it's damaged during conflict and then looking at how if you can divide up and fairly share and allow access equal access to natural resources that can be used to help uh, build peace uh, post conflict um so yeah so this whole kind of continuum of conflict in the environment so um it's quite big the environment generally and conflict in the environment is also quite big which is why i'm going to focus a little bit on conflict pollution rather than trying to spend trying to squeeze everything in in, in 20 minutes so um yeah this is my point made before about this lack of data and lack of visibility for the environment in conflicts this and this silent casualty um and we can see a number of different ways that the environment is damaged during conflict uh, and as i saw before and how it can lead to conflict and how it can help build peace afterwards so it's a bit of a cliche the whole silent casualty thing but it's still true because obviously people look primarily at the humanitarian impact of conflict but a little bit short-sighted because a lot of the times the humanitarian impact and the environmental impact are fundamentally connected because people need to breathe and drink water and grow crops and get access to resources so environmental issues are very much humanitarian issues in conflict so there's kind of six sort of key ways in which the environment can be damaged by conflict um so one obvious one very visible one is toxic hazards and pollution from damage to industrial sites so this is the Panchevo oil refinery <coughs> uh, near Belgrade, which NATO bombed repeatedly. Um, they argued that it was being used for the war effort. It wasn't really, and there were more effective ways you could have shut down what it was doing by, for example, stopping it, moving its products out of the refinery rather than actually just bombing the refinery. And this caused serious pollution incidents um, across a fair amount of southeastern Europe, uh, pollution in the Danube, loads of very unpleasant chemicals were burnt. It was a big issue. Um, second one is kind of a legacy of the use of weapons <coughs> and munitions. 
which obviously is very common to a lot of conflicts. Um, so there's obviously very uh, well-known ones like issues around Agent Orange herbicides or depleted uranium weapons. But even conventional weapon explosives, most of them are toxic, most of them contain heavy metals. We don't really know very much about how much is left in the environment and in cities after these weapons have been used, but um, it would be great if some more research was done. Um, but yeah, that's a clear environmental impact, and not just from the immediate use of the weapons, but also the legacy of the weapons. So for example, uh, minefields, robbing people of access to agricultural resources, for example. Next one is human displacement. So that's not just the places that people are forcibly moved to, but the places that they move through to get to where they're going. So this is the Zatari camp in Jordan, um, which is hosting a huge number of Syrian refugees, but also looking at 3 million in Turkey, looking at huge numbers in Lebanon. And so sudden increases in population in these other places create these sort of transboundary environmental impacts. So people are leaving Syria, going to these other countries, having to be hosted by communities, and certainly in that region around Syria, you know, they're already water resource scarce. Um, so hosting these people, providing waste services, health services, creates significant environmental costs uh, for the communities that host them. Not that it's any fault of the displaced people because they don't have any choice in the matter, but unless these things are managed properly, then it can lead to community tensions and grievances and also cause localised environmental problems around refugee camps and displacement camps. The next sort of key element of these <coughs> six issues is this use of extractive industries. Um, so if you're familiar with conflict diamonds or conflict gold, or in this case, coltan, stuff that's in your mobile phones being mined in DRC. And this is quite a complicated story, you know, because a lot of these resources, they provide livelihoods for artisanal miners, but at the same time, these resources are often used by armed groups and also by states themselves to fuel and fund conflicts uh, along the way, causing significant environmental damage. Which is not to say that the industrial extractive companies don't also cause vast amounts of damage as well. So it's not just these sort of small scale artisanal miners who are problematic. It's also the large scale rapacious industrial extractives who are often active in conflict zones. Next one is sort of damage to water, sanitation and waste infrastructure. Um, this is from Gaza uh, and this was a water tower. And this is a problem you see in a lot of conflicts, particularly these days where they're mostly moving to urban areas and you have the intensive use of explosive weapons and you can damage infrastructure, destroy pipes, but also there's a kind of reverberating effect. So for example, with water treatment facilities, they need electricity to run, you knock out the electricity, treatment facility doesn't work, you may have pollution from that facility. Um, but you may also have a brain drain of the technical technicians and engineers who should be operating these things who are then forced to flee. People don't have water, sanitation systems are disrupted, wastewater disposal is disrupted. This leads to environmental pollution as well as creating uh, public health risks. Next, we have the deliberate targeting of natural resources to cause environmental damage. And this is this using the environment as a weapon of war. So this is the town of Kiara in Iraq, where Islamic State set fire to a large number of oil wells um, to spread terror and to cause general environmental damage. They also caused huge amounts of disruption and damage to agricultural areas in northern Iraq as they retreated kind of a, a scorched earth policy, robbing the local people of the uh, things which they needed for their survival. And in the case of Iraq, you know, these wells burnt for months and months. Pipelines were also opened and oil was flooding through the streets. And this is something which is going to take a very long time to uh, remediate and clean up. So those are kind of direct ways in which conflict uh, causes damage to the environment, but they're also indirect ways. And so one of the sort of most significant ones and ones we've seen a lot of conflicts is disruption to governance. So if the state collapses, there's no environment ministry who's uh, implementing environmental programs and policies. International donors aren't coming in and focusing on the environment because they're focusing on direct humanitarian assistance. All of a sudden, you always may have systems of protected areas or policies to try and make climate change adaptation or pollution control and all that sort of collapses because you have this loss of governance. So uh, can have a little bit of a look at conflict pollution in particular and toxic remnants of war which is something we've worked on for uh, some years. Um, so yeah it's kind of ever since World War One, like the first industrial conflict where you had 
billions of uh, rounds of ammunition being used in these slab areas of northern France, which have extremely high levels of heavy metal pollution as a result and can't be farmed. And so this kind of ever since then you have this industrialization of warfare creating a toxicity which we see in a lot of conflicts very notorious at times um, uh, some of the pollution incidents uh, and this toxicity it depends on how the war is fought who's fighting and whereabouts it's fight, whereabouts it's being fought and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment um, Interestingly, some of these really big pollution incidents where you have huge black clouds of smoke and very photogenic incidents, often the trigger for some of the policy and legal measures which have been created to try and increase legal protection of the environment in conflict. Um, so just briefly, yeah, a toxic around of war is any toxic or radiological substance resulting from military activities that forms a hazard to humans or ecosystems. So pollution stuff, essentially. Um, these are some of the different kinds that we see. I could get the pointer out. So pollution from military activities, it happens before conflict. So if you look at weapons manufacturing facilities, which may emit large amounts of pollution, uh, looking at training and testing grounds where huge amounts of munitions are used in testing and training uh, and lead to pollution in some areas. Uh, weapons residues, we talked about before, they can be very polluting. Uh, we see quite a lot of unplanned controlled stockpile explosions so all this stuff that's stored by militaries quite often they explode and that can create large amounts of heavy metal pollution and pollution from energetic material and explosives um guys not a very good point of the mouse is it because it going up anyway um military use of herbicides so agent orange in vietnam but we also see it in colombia for example um to try and control coca production with much support from the us um Emissions from military bases, see quite a lot of bases globally where, uh, for example, in Japan, where you have a lot of US bases and also in Korea, where when the US set up the bases, there weren't really any environmental controls drawn into the agreements that allows them to set up a base there. And because of that, you had quite serious pollution incidents over a very long period of time. Uh, but we also see it uh, in more recent times in Iraq with the use of burn pits, which is the poor military waste management, um, where all the stuff that's left over is just burnt rather than being disposed of properly. Similar problem with some of this explosive use of explosive weapons in urban areas, which generates huge amounts of rubble, it might be contaminated with asbestos and weapons residues and all the stuff that was in the buildings prior to them being destroyed. And that can be a huge issue. So places like Mosul, where you have millions of tons of rubble, which are going to have to be disposed of. Um, getting rid of weapons. So most weapons aren't actually used in war are used in training or they just disposed of at the end of their life um and how you dispose of them is quite important in terms of environmental pollution so in the us they still do a lot of open burning and open destruction of munitions blowing them up in the open air or burning them in the open air and that can create serious pollution problems uh, you also have issues around abandoned military material um you have quite a lot of places in uh, Afghanistan or elsewhere where Soviets or the US may have just abandoned and dumped <coughs> vehicles and other equipment which may contain radioactive or chemically toxic materials. <coughs> and then during conflicts you have issues around direct targeting energy infrastructure um, which con can contain many toxic materials. Industrial sites uh, Populated areas, again, just damage and destruction can lead to localized pollution. Let's see what's underneath it. And then as I talked about before, this kind of breakdown in environmental governance and loss of capacity for environmental assessment as well. And breakdown in environmental services, basic things like who collects rubbish in war zones? How is that disposed of? Is it just dumped anywhere? And what are the environmental issues associated with that? So all of these things create toxic and pollution legacies. Um, so yeah, can have a little look at some conflicts, <clears throat> just give you an idea and a sense of the kind of problems that we see in our monitoring work. Um, Eastern Ukraine is a terrible place to have a war. Um, so for 200 years, the Donbass area of Eastern Ukraine, it sits on huge coal reserves. And so you had this massive build up of industry in this area. Um, kind of Soviet area 
heavy industry so it contains huge numbers of collieries and metallurgical plants and other dangerous operations there's a huge number of coal mines pipelines the whole lot so it's a terrible place to be using artillery or um, fighting more generally and there's some locations which are particularly problematic so this one down here is a phenol factory which has its lake with incredibly hazardous uh, pollutants in it held back by a very small dam and it's now being caught up in the fighting so it's right next to the front line and the Ukrainian forces know that the opposition forces know that it's a potential environmental disaster and they've actually set up their uh, or housing their troops just next to it because they know the opposition won't fire on it so basically using it as a, a toxic shield almost in the conflict um, but yeah, we're going to publish some stuff next week, I think, around some of these issues. So all of these coal mines, which are in this area, so they, a lot of them were close to being abandoned and you have to pump water out of mines when you close them. Otherwise you get this acid mine drainage, water full of heavy metals and other nasties. Um, and we found some evidence that this isn't happening. <coughs> the pumping has been switched off by loss of electricity or by political decisions. Uh, and so you're going to have these huge risks of groundwater pollution and river pollution as a result. On from Ukraine to Syria. So these are some various examples. So obviously a buildup of waste and rubbish that's not being disposed of. A particular industrial site. So this is a, a cement factory which was repeatedly attacked. Um, down here you have Aleppo and this is kind of an interesting point that big cities like Aleppo and I don't know if you look at Manchester as well or we'll look at Salford, there are industrial facilities within the cities themselves and these cities are now the focus of the fighting and so there are quite serious pollution risks from these industrial facilities which are located in cities and you could see the same thing potentially happening in Manchester and Salford if they had the misfortune to be on the front line of a conflict. Um, and then one, yeah, interesting, and it's also happened in Iraq, but particularly prevalent in Syria, and this was this rise of artisanal oil refinery. So NATO and Russia and also the UK, when they entered the conflict, they wanted to knock out uh, Islamic State's control of oil production in Syria to rob them of their revenue, which they were using to fight with. And so they went in and they attacked. The first thing the UK did when it first target that it bombed when it entered the conflict and Syria was an oil refinery and Syria's oil refinery capacity was completely knocked out by various powers and the people in Syria obviously still need oil to put in their cars and for heating and so you had this whole industry <coughs> of artisanal oil refining set up and essentially you have these burners which are large barrels full of crude oil which are then manned 24 hours crude oil being chucked on them and burnt to get them up to temperature and then use that to fractionate petrol and diesel from uh, a lot of the time it's orphans and kids who are working on these things uh, and as you can see it leaves these appalling polluting scars and you could see these sort of growing like a cancer uh, throughout the years of the conflict as this practice expanded and it's still prevalent in Syria today. Okay next we shall go to Libya um, so kind of Libya conflict is the story of oil and water and so on this side we have oil so there are useful storage sites on the north coast of Libya which have been accidentally hit during fighting and deliberately hit during fighting causing very large fires which are visible from space and then on this side so this is a town called Saba in Libya uh, and in the center of this animation and here there's a water treatment facility um, there haven't been repairs to the water treatment facility, there's nobody to fix stuff. Parts have been stolen from it and so you've had these repeated periods of wastewater flooding right in the middle of the city and this has been going on an ongoing basis now for four years and so you have wastewater flooding into the town and city uh, around this area. And this is what it looks like <coughs> on the ground. Uh, from Libya to Iraq, so that photo at the start with the burning oil wells around Kayara. Um, these are some of them around here, taken from space, but then you also have this white plume in addition to the black plume of the oil, and this is a sulphur factory. 
uh, called Al Mishrak, um, where you have huge stocks of sulfur sitting on the ground. So Islamic State set fire to them, creating this huge plume of sulfur dioxide, um, which hospitalized around a thousand people and killed 12 due to the inhalation of sulfur dioxide. Um, and yeah, and this stuff is huge. It's visible from space and you have hundreds of square kilometers affected by fallout from these oil plumes, um, which are going to lead to long-term contamination of agricultural areas that people depend on. From there to Yemen, um, and this, this is still an ongoing story. So this is Ras Issa, which is just to the north of the port of Hodeida, which you may be familiar with in the news, which is where a lot of the humanitarian aid go, enters Yemen. Um, and at the end of here, you have a pipeline which goes out to this, which is a large, extremely large super tanker, um, which is the same age that I am, uh, which is quite old and single hulled, much like myself, um, and contains somewhere between a million and four million barrels of crude oil. <coughs> Since the Houthis uh, captured this part of Yemen, nobody has been onto the vessel which was already in pretty flaky condition. Um, and now the Houthis aren't allowing access to the United Nations to do a technical assessment of the safety of this. So there's this huge risk from this ship that normally these tankers, they pump inert gases into the storage chambers uh, on the vessel. And that's to try and keep down all the volatile gases, which you get from oil when it's stored in these large metal boats in hot places on warm seas um, but none of that's been happening because no one's been on the ship its engines haven't been running and creating this coolant uh, of these inert gases to keep these uh, volatile gases down so this could potentially explode and cause an environmental catastrophe at any second and it's got four times as much oil on it um, as the um, uh, jiggy oil spill in Alaska um, his name just escapes me for a moment because I've been awake for a long time. Anyway, um, yeah, there's a huge risk of a potential environmental catastrophe um, and it's still ongoing um, with no sign of resolution at the moment because the Houthi want the oil which is on there, which is worth, or at least up until a few days ago, it was worth around $80 million. Um, and so it's become this bargaining chip in the conflict and it could potentially affect this quite important marine protected area of Cameron Island, just to the north of it, but also the wider Red Sea ecosystem. And then from Yemen to Afghanistan. Um, so yeah, this is another issue around kind of environmental governance in conflicts. Um, so obviously Afghanistan has been facing conflict for 30, 40 years. It doesn't have amazing capacity to deal with environmental issues. And every year in Kabul, partly because of the shape of the valley, so it's kind of in this bowl-shaped depression. Um, you have huge issues around air pollution, but also because of the stuff that people burn in the city. Uh, so if you look on the graphics over here, so the US Embassy in Kabul has an air quality monitoring station on its roof, and so we pulled down the data from that, and this is how it looked. So the green is acceptable clean air, there's not very much green, it's like 0.5% of the time of this four month period last year, September up to December. And then at the end of the year, yeah, it got really serious and there were around uh, 8,000 people hospitalized as a result of uh, exposure to air pollution. <coughs> but Afghanistan isn't in a great position to be able to do anything about it because it's suffering from conflict because of its weak environmental governance uh, and capacity to deal with it. So this is yeah, pollution in Afghanistan kills more people every year than armed violence does but obviously the armed violence is gets the headlines and captures the imagination so i'm going to drink some more gin it's water <clears throat> um so what's been done about it um yeah we see environmental damage in all the conflicts that we look at there's always an environmental dimension wherever you look some of them more serious than others but it's yeah consistent throughout so in the last 10 years in particular, there have been a kind of bit of a resurgence of interest in trying to improve environmental protection in conflict and to better integrate the environment into pre-conflict risk assessments, but also into how states recover from conflict. So we've worked on a couple of these. So the UN Environment Assembly, which is kind of this global parliament for the environment in Nairobi, which meets every couple of years. So we worked on resolutions there. There was one 
a general one on protection of the environment and areas affected by armed conflict and then another one on conflict pollution and toxic rounds of war. In particular, the UN Security Council has been increasingly working on environmental issues uh, over the last sort of 15 years, 20 years. Uh, and so initially that was looking at natural resources, so conflict minerals and timber and diamonds and gold. But then from 2007 onwards, been looking at climate change and security risks, also been looking at water security more recently, and that's to try and integrate sort of environmental concerns into the UN security assessments that it does for various conflicts. Um, there's also been legal initiatives uh, to try and improve the legal framework protecting the environment in relation to conflicts. So the big one for us has been this UN International Law Commission study. So the International Law Commission is a body of august legal experts which um, provides advice to the UN General Assembly on uh, the progressive development of international law. And that was asked by UN Environment Programme in 2009 to look at the law protecting the environment in conflicts because it sucks really that very, very limited protections under international humanitarian law. Um, so I'll come on to that in a second. But then in addition, we have the Red Cross who are updating some guidelines that they first published in 1996. And that's the guidelines they give to militaries to advise them on how to protect the environment better during conflict. Uh, and they're supposed to be out in <coughs> August this year. <coughs> Although who knows when. Um, also recently, there's been a specific kind of initiative on protecting water infrastructure in conflicts. Um, and that's the Geneva list on the protection of water infrastructure. Uh, and again, that looks at guidelines and the existing law for how civilian objects like water infrastructure should be protected in conflict. Um, so this first one, the International Law Commission one. So yeah, it's quite a big thing. It's the biggest thing to happen to the law protecting the environment in conflicts um, since the uh, 70s, essentially. Um, so this is interesting because international humanitarian law, it protects, offers some protection for the environment during conflicts. But what the International Law Commission has done is looking at protection before conflicts and looking at protection after conflicts as well as during. So it's this in relation to armed conflicts and the handy acronym of PERAC. Um, international humanitarian laws protection of the environment is really weak. It's very ill-defined. You can theoretically cause a staggering amount of damage before it's a breach of any law and obviously compliance is rubbish and nobody polices it. Um, so it offers very limited protection at the moment. So what the International Law Commission have done, they've tried to create draft principles, which they're non-binding, but states refused anything which might be binding. Um, but what they've tried to do is bring in not just international humanitarian law, but also human rights law. Um, so there's a developing right to a healthy environment uh, and also environmental law and to try and kind of merge it all together to create these draft principles. And they cover loads of stuff. So from conservation and protected areas to indigenous peoples so what corporations do in areas affected by conflict military bases remnants of war what happens during occupation uh, and also victim assistance as well so they've been working on these for like 10 years uh, and the process is going to reach its kind of concluding stage in 2021 uh, and then it's a question of how would these be implemented and how can we actually ensure they have an impact on the ground, particularly as they'll be <coughs> non-binding. Um, other initiatives are looking at sort of integrating the environment into things that the international community do already. So for example, sort of humanitarian response. And um, this initiative is being run by UN to try and encourage humanitarian actors to think about the environment more in what they do, <coughs> like the siting of refugee camps, for example. Uh, as you saw in the first slide, UN peacekeeping operations, so looking at how they integrate the environment. And that's been important in countries like Mali, for example, where um, you're already having huge impacts from climate change and desertification. And so if the UN peacekeepers don't integrate environmental issues into their activities, then it's very likely that they won't bring communities with them to actually help them build peace. Um, peace building more generally so there's this general trend to try and introduce more environmental uh, issues into peace building so looking at how the environment can be a tool for cooperation between different communities and parties 
and then also in mine action uh, so landmine clearance and that's something we're currently working on uh, of how that can do less harm to the environment in the process of removing mines um, so yeah back to the I guess initial question of whether it's the environment is still a silent victim um, it's a lot more visible than it used to be um, because of all the cool tools that we have these days to <coughs> document harm and the more visible it is the more interest we've been getting on the policy initiatives uh, more attention it's been getting but there's still a big gap between what happens at the un and the chat between diplomats and the bits of paper that we lobby for and actually what happens on the ground where the environment is always going to be you know fairly low priority for warring parties uh, and that kind of gap between these ideas and how they're implemented on the ground is uh, the difference between protecting and not protecting people and ecosystems um so finally um yeah the questions that we're facing is how can we make the best use of the new ways and tools of collecting and analyzing data um another one is how do you actually compel states and also non-state armed groups and private contractors and others on how to comply with environmental protection norms how do you increase accountability to actually you know in the civil sector there's fines and things if companies damage the environment but what is there in terms of holding states and governments to account for environmental damage they cause in conflicts there's, there's very little out there at the moment uh, and then what are the mechanisms that need to be developed to actually assist people affected by environmental damage and conflict uh, and that's it i think so so thank you very much and try to this thank way. you doug that was sick as always like i every time we do this presentation which now seems to be a couple of times and thank you so much for agreeing to do them for us and with us it's always a yeah i i always i feel like i learn new things and yet i improve the knowledge on things that i already have we have quite a few questions so clearly you sparked a couple of interest brains it brings interests and brains yes um but before we get started with those questions i wanted to ask you um where do nuclear weapons and like nuclear energy come into this one waste um we you know, this, the group organization that's co-hosting this is the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. And although every example that you gave is a clear reason as to why the environment should be considered a lot more when it comes to these things, um, I wanted to know if you had any insights on nuclear waste and, yeah, nuclear weapons and stuff when it comes to that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so we work with some of the ICANN um, organizations who are working on the environmental remediation and victim assistance part of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons uh, and these are the two sort of positive obligations that the treaty creates so part of it is about banning the weapons but then there's also this victim assistance element of it which was modeled on the victim assistance principles in the convention on cluster munitions and the landmine ban treaty um, and it's looking at how the treaty once it comes enters into force so you'll be having review conferences every couple of years for all the states who are party to it um, encouraging states to develop national action plans for how they're going to deal with legacy contamination from nuclear testing uh, for example in their countries so uh, places like Kazakhstan you've got huge issues around it Australia and others and uh, Pacific Islands um, so looking at what are the mechanics of how this treaty can be used to help reduce uh, health, health damage and environmental risk from the legacy of nuclear weapons testing. Um, on a sort of, yeah, on a different tip around um, nuclear weapons, yeah, it's interesting, the international humanitarian law serves so a couple of customary principles about um, ways of not causing lots of damage to the environment during conflict and it's notable that the nuclear weapon states whether well, the UK and the US in particular have never signed up or recognized the customary status of those parts of international law um, and they object to it and they object to it because they want to be free to use nuclear weapons so there's issues around not uh, attacking the environment as a reprisal in a conflict which you're not supposed to do under international law um, but the US and the UK object to that because clearly a reprisal attack with nuclear weapons would completely trash the environment uh, of the other party and actually it has got a long shadow of these issues so when the International Law Commission started their their work the special rapporteur who was always very progressive and very um, engaged and enthused on trying to move the project forward she 
recommended that it doesn't deal with weapons at all. So there's nothing on what the environmental impact of weapons in the International Law Commission's principles because she knew that governments would push back really hard against that because of the nuclear weapons issue. Um, so yeah. Classic. Classic. Um, is there, Jackie Burke from CND is wondering if there's any comment on who will set the norms, um, you know, especially when displaced people have back and if they will be pushed back to move, like if they will be pushed to move back too early, as we've seen in Belarus after Chernobyl accident. Do we have any idea? Um, for returnees um, in conflict settings. Um, yeah, I mean, you've seen the issues in Turkey. So when Turkey made their move to move into northern Syria uh, last year, and they were going to create this buffer zone of around 30 miles or so, and the aim of that was to move people, some of the Syrian refugees from Turkey into those areas, as well as uh, antagonize the Kurds. Um, you have seen people being forced back, and just the other week you had Turkish, the Turks managed to shut down a very important water treatment facility which provided water to 400,000 people and this was in the face of the COVID epidemic and obviously having access to water is pretty crucial uh, for mm -hmm. reducing transmission. Um, so you do see states moving people around and forcibly displacing already displaced people into areas where they don't necessarily have the resources to support themselves. Um, I also see some issues around uh, Lake Chad as well, where you have communities who have been displaced and then returnees coming back and also new people moving into the area and you don't necessarily have enough uh, access to resources for everybody. So then there are issues around community cohesion and sparking new conflicts by people being pushed back into areas where they don't have the uh, resources to support them. Yeah, that's heartbreaking. Um, do we know if, uh, so Pam Flynn from also CND wants to know if the PERAC principles, um, you know, will be in, like, will cohere with the COP26 next year? Hmm. Yeah, so the, the climate and security track is slightly separate to the PERAC legal principles, uh, right. protection in relation to conflicts track. Um, so the climate security stuff, there will definitely be uh, events at COP26 in relation to that. Um, it's an interesting one because so it was the UK who had the first, organised the first debate on climate security in the Security Council. Uh, they're progressive on it and they're pushing on it. Um, Hitherto, it's been Russia who've been most problematic in the Security Council because they object to this securitization of the environment. Um, and there are yeah, a number of reasons for that, some of which is Russian trolling, but also kind of legitimate sort of questions about what happens if you securitize the environment and securitize responses to climate change. And is that actually helpful in that respect? Um, in some respects, it is because, it, you know, if you're looking at climate risks and fragility, then that's something which the UN, for example, needs to integrate into its peacekeeping operations and things like that. But then could you take it to its weirdest extension of saying, well, X country, for example, the US is not sticking to its obligations under COP. Therefore, we shall have a, a military intervention in the US to ensure that they actually meet uh, their carbon emissions targets because at the moment they're placing the security of the whole world at risk. It's a ridiculous extension, but you know, you can see the problem with over militarizing some of these environmental responses. That's um, a good point. <laughs> I, yeah, okay. To there was a, an amusing thought paper which was going to in rounds the other week, which was uh, this question of whether you in this far-flung future you could imagine targeted drone strike killings of oil industry executives because they were placing the world at risk. <laughs> well, I'm not going to advocate or condone anything. I'm just going to leave that there because that's just an interesting, like, it, mm, yeah, not an idea. Nobody get any ideas. Don't want to be responsible here. But, um, um, just on just pounds just follow, actually, on the Women, Peace and Security agenda. Um, yeah, that's maybe an approach which, so a lot for the last few years there's been this big push just on climate security in the Security Council, which we don't really agree with because we think it needs to be environment, peace and security because it's not just yeah. about climate. Um, and actually the Women, Peace and Security 
agenda is kind of a model which it may well be worth following in some respects but the idea of that was to mainstream women and gender into the security agenda and the issue we face at the moment with the environment is it's not mainstreamed in the UN and its national security agenda so right. instead of just looking at climate security should we be instead looking at the security council resolution on environment peace and security which facilitates the uh, mainstreaming of the environment across all of these different security issues at an uh, international level yeah um in regards to uh syria how many i think they've asked like refugee camps um or like displaced people camps um i you know just to get an idea of obviously when you were describing the situations that can and usually do place there you know i think this person is just trying to get a better idea of how many camps there are in syria if you know um i don't know the figures off the top of my head um unhcr website's got um a handy map tool um but yeah. there are what five million displaced in uh lebanon and turkey and jordan um yeah but i don't know the precise figures for syria yeah. itself but it's in the tens tens of millions um not in the tens of millions um yeah yeah i'm not sure on the idp figures uh, yeah a lot of people and i'm supposing they don't have the actual you know accurate I mean, not fully accurate stats necessarily, because like in moments like that, everyone's just kind of dispersing, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, I think they, they're pretty good with the stats for people who cross its national borders. Um, okay. So in terms of the numbers in, in Lebanon and Turkey and elsewhere, they're fairly accurate. Um, but obviously yeah. there's more question marks over the yeah. number of IDPs within the country itself. Yeah. Um, we have some questions about the air pollution in Kabul, because that was freaky. Um, so if we were to compare it to like London air pollution, how would it compare? Uh, quite a lot worse. It's, quite a lot worse. Okay. <laughs> it's grim. It's, it's, make... <laughs> it's one of the most polluted cities in the world, I think, uh, with uh, Delhi and, and various others. Right. Okay. So I'll reassure some Londoners that are here today, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, and if the air pollution in Kabul kills more people than the conflict, is this something that's common when you, we look at you know, the aftermath of, of conflicts that there's actually more um, victims, you know, from the lack of environmental protection? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you look at, uh, so it's not just, I guess, the air pollution in Kabul, which kills more people in the conflict, but in Afghanistan as a whole, pollution issues, so that's water pollution and air pollution will lead to more deaths and untimely deaths than armed violence will. And that's something which is, yeah, relatively common in uh, in many conflicts i think where you have this wholesale collapse of environmental governance and you know afghanistan's been affected by conflict for 40 years from a developmental level it's yeah it, it's way behind where it should be uh, and in terms of maternal health in terms of child health in terms of access to clean water and all the rest of it you know it's just not there and the reason it's not there is because it's been affected by conflict and insecurity for so long yeah yeah no for sure it's always you know you always hear like whenever comes back to rebuilding or like uh, post-conflict mediation and stuff like that. It's, it's always about the people, which is good, <laughs> but we should consider other things if we want the people to actually thrive. Um, and speaking of thriving, uh, will the earth ever recover in Ukraine following <laughs> all of that, that you told us today as well? <laughs> um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um... It's funny, there's been a lot of concern about these sort of environmental emergencies caused by a serious chemical leak from one of these facilities. Yeah. Thus far, <clears throat> we haven't seen one, um, but what we have seen is, yeah, this sort of really widespread long-term concerns over the impact of this sort of collapse of mining. So in addition to sort of groundwater pollution, when you stop pumping water from the mines, as the water level rises, you have methane being driven up, so you have more people's cellars exploding uh, essentially but you also have land subsidence subsidence as well across these areas and once these mines are waterlogged it's really difficult to actually sort of row back from that so this is potentially a yeah long-term and permanent impact that the conflict will have um in addition the, uh, for the um cnd fans out there so there's a mine which is next door to the one that we've been looking at this week um, where in 1979, uh, Russia set off a nuclear device um, 
and the idea was to they had issues around uh, gas build up and these explosions but kept killing miners so they thought well if we set off a, a nuclear device in this mine it might be a way of actually getting rid of the methane which is just bizarre and it was in that kind of period where there was this like <laughs> uh, non-military use of nuclear weapons for things like digging canals and yeah getting rid of gas from mines and stuff so there's a yeah core of um, cesium and other stuff in this mine uh, which again is no longer being pumped out so this is potentially filling up with water which then may lead to radioactive contamination from this mine getting into the groundwater and into rivers in this part of ukraine um, jesus <laughs> ridiculous sorry i just like never understand how people think oh yeah this one thing that like basically annihilated two cities can totally be used in a safe and controlled way right now mm -hmm. it's absolutely thing. bizarre uh, like, but, uh, yeah if you check our website and sign up to our list you'll get the blog next week which will then um, tell you all about the uh, mine dramas in ukraine yeah it's quite it's quite dramatic my goodness um i think this might be the last question but for those who have joined us uh you know, recently. Um, we're going to be taking questions for the next five more minutes as well. So, you know, if you've got any, definitely throw them in the, the chat box. Um, but what is Ground Zero Week? I think you mentioned Ground Zero Week. I mentioned Ground Zero Week? Yes. This is from Ginsella as well. So, you know who's asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure's on. Uh, oh, maybe it is Gin. Um, Ground Zero Week. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, I don't know what Ground Zero Week is. Oh, no. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe. there's some other words that sounded like Ground Zero Week. Yes, 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 yes. Um, you need to go back in your brain and find what it was that you were saying, Doug, right now. Yeah, <laughs> no, good luck, good luck, yeah. <laughs> um, oh. yeah, I don't know. I don't know. No? Yeah. I mean, that's all right. Um, I think that is every question that, that we received. Thank you so much for asking them also, because yeah, there's a bunch of stuff. I'm sure we all learned more from these questions being answered by the ever so wonderful and enlightening Doug. Um, I will shower you with compliments. Um, <laughs> going to bomb the oil moguls. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, um, the, a lot of satire going around. But um, essentially, I do you have any, you know, parting words before I say our I do. Uh, yeah, sign up for our blogs and stuff. There yes. you go. That's the link to it. Um, we just put the link. Blogs every now and again on interesting and intriguing things. And uh, yeah, if you want to learn more about the environmental issues in any of these conflicts, if you check out our website, it's huh. um, yeah, it's got whole pages full of stuff in different conflicts like Iraq and Yemen and elsewhere. Yeah. So if you want some resources to learn more about all this stuff, then it's an excellent place to start. If I do say so. Oh wait. We have one final question, which I think is so perfect to end, but do you think the environment can ever fully recover after war? <laughs> You're in the hot seat. <laughs> um, yeah, it depends how it was damaged. Um, and, you know, living somewhere like uh, the Calder Valley, where you go for a walk in the woods and see all the bits of old industrial mills sticking out that have been completely overgrown and reclaimed. Um, you realize that some of these issues are temporary, certainly mm -hmm. on a geological scale. Um, but at the same time, you know, there are oil spills that were caused in the Gulf War in 1991, which are still being cleaned up today, which is 25, 26 years, 27 years later. Um, so yeah, a lot of these forms of environmental damage can be very long lasting. And as I mentioned at the start, World War I battlefields in Northern France, that was literally 100 years ago, and they're still contaminated and damaged and showing all the scars from uh, the conflict. So yeah, we can cause damage which is permanent on human scales. Yeah. There's an island, there's actually, so I'm from like Northwest of France in Brittany and there's, I live like right on the coast and then there's an island on like the beach near my house. Mm -hmm. It's an island that's pretty far out, but we can see it. And um, for the longest time when I was a kid, they told me that we weren't allowed to ever go on there because it was still full of mines from World War II. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking like, wow, this is crazy. This piece of land that's just not far from the beach that could explode at any moment. But apparently it's been taken care of now, so yeah. Um, but 
Yeah, sorry, you were going to say something? I wasn't, no, 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 I was just... Uh... Okay. No, it's just me then. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Doug. That was awesome, as always. And um, best of luck, obviously, with both CEOs and just life in general, because um, hashtag pandemic in it. So here we are. Um, but yeah, I'm sh I, yeah I, I look forward to speaking more and doing more fun stuff and yeah, making the world a better place hopefully. Um, but some few parting words. Thank you all so much for joining us today. That was awesome. I'm so glad. 18 participants. That's all. That's so cute. It's like a little community. Um, we'll be doing this next week, uh, not the same time, this time at 6 p.m. And we will be with uh, Sienna Bengara from the Campaign Against Arms Trade, who will give us the more like societal, you know, point of view of, um, of this intriguing question. Um, and in the meantime, you will all be receiving an email um, that will include multiple things, including like all of the information that Doug wrote in the chat about like where to find him and see his website and everything. So don't worry if you didn't catch that just then, we'll get it in your inbox. Um, and the email will also include um, fundraising links to both campaign for nuclear disarmament and for education, because you know, we're trying to keep going and everything. Um, Yes, and their Twitter handle is at Detox Conflict, and we've tagged them a couple of times on our uh, page as well. So if you go on there, you should find it too. Um, and I think that that is all I have to say. Um, yeah, just make sure you come back next week at 6 p.m. That would be awesome and wonderful. Oh, and um, this, yes, <laughs> thank you, Ginsella, in the chats. This recording will be on YouTube. Uh, we've been recording the chat the entire time. So, yes, wonderful. Oh, oh, has he gone? All right, well, I guess it's dismissal time. Thank you all so much for joining. Bye. <laughs>